Please stand. Let us pray. O God, who by the passion of Christ, your Son, our Lord, abolish the death inherited from ancient sin by every succeeding generation, grant that just as being conformed to him, we have borne by the law of nature the image of the man of earth. So by the sanctification of grace, that we may bear the image of man of heaven. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Please be seated. A reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. See, my servant shall prosper. He shall be raised high and greatly exalted. Even as many were amazed at him, so marred was his look beyond human semblance, and his appearance beyond that of the sons of man. So shall he startle many nations. Because of him, Kings stand speechless, for those who have not been told shall see, those who have not heard shall ponder. Who would believe what we have heard? To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up like a sapling before him, like a shoot from the parched earth. There was in him no stately bearing to make us look at him nor appearance that would attract us to him. He was spurned and avoided by people, a man of suffering, accustomed to infirmity, one of those from whom people hid their faces, spurned, and we held him in no esteem. Yet it was our infirmities that he bore, our suffering that he endured. While we thought of him as stricken, as one smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our offenses, crushed for our sins. Upon him was the chastisement that makes us whole. By his stripes we are healed. We had all gone astray like sheep, each following his own way. But the Lord laid upon him the guilt of us all. Though he was harshly treated, he submitted and opened not his mouth, like a lamb led to slaughter, or a sheep before the shearer. He was silent and opened not his mouth. Oppressed and condemned, he was taken away. And who would have thought any more of his destiny? When he was cut off from the land of the living and smitten for the sins of his, this pious people, a grave was assigned to him among the wicked, and a burial place 
with evildoers, though he had done no wrong, nor spoken any falsehood. But the Lord was pleased to crush him in infirmity. If he gives his life as an offering for sin, he shall see his descendants in a long life, and the will of the Lord shall be accomplished through him. Because of his afflictions, he shall see the light in fullness of days. Though his suffering, many, my servant shall justi justify many, and their guilt he shall bear. Therefore, I will give him the portion among the great, and he shall divide the spoils with the mighty. Because he surrendered himself to death and was counted among the wicked, and he shall take away the sins of many and win pardon for their offense. The word of the Lord. Thank you, God.
reading from the letter to the Hebrews. Brothers and sisters, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has similarly been tested in every way, yet without sin. So let us confidently approach the throne of grace to receive mercy and to find grace for timely help. In the days when Christ was in the flesh, he offered prayers and supplication with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverence. Son, though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered. And when he was made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. My brothers and sisters, the Lord be with you. The passion of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to the Gospel of Mark. Please be seated. The Passover of the Feast of Unleavened Bread were to take place in two days' time. So the chief priests and the scribes were seeking a way to arrest Jesus from trickery and to put him to death. They said, Whom are you looking for? Jesus, the Nazarean. Whom are you looking for? Jesus, the Nazarene. I am. Judas, his betrayer, was also with them. When Jesus said to them, I am, they turned away and they fell to the ground. So Jesus again asked them, Whom are you looking for? Jesus, the Nazarene. I told you that I am. So if you were looking for me, let these men go. This was to fulfill what he had said. I have not lost any of those you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it, struck the high priest's slave, and cut off his right ear. The slave's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword into its scabbard. Shall I not drink the cup that my father gave me? So the band of soldiers, the tribune, and the Jewish guards seized Jesus, 
bound him, and brought him first to Annas. He was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year. It was Caiaphas who had counseled the Jews that it was better that one man should die rather than the people. Simon Peter and another disciple followed Jesus. Now the other disciple was known to the high priest, and he entered the courtyard of the high priest with Jesus. But Peter stood at the gate outside. So the other disciple, the acquaintance of the high priest, went out and spoke to the gatekeeper and brought Peter in. Then the maid, who was the gatekeeper, said to Peter, you are not one of this man's disciples, are you? I am not. Now the slaves and the guards were standing around a charcoal fire that they had made because it was cold and were warming themselves. Peter was also standing there keeping warm. The high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his doctrine. Jesus answered him. I have spoken publicly to the world I have always taught in a synagogue or in the temple area where all the Jews gathered. And in secret, I have said nothing. Why ask me? Ask those who have heard me what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said this, one of the temple guards standing there struck Jesus and said, Is this the way you answer the high priest? If I have spoken wrongly, testify to the wrong. But if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? Then Anna sent Jesus, bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing there, keeping warm. And they said to him, You are not one of his disciples, are you? I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, a relative of the one whose Peter ear had cut off, said, Didn't I see you in the garden with him? Again, Peter denied it, and immediately the cock crowed. <clears throat> Then they brought Jesus from Caiaphas to the Praetorium. It was morning. They themselves did not enter the Praetorium in order not to be defiled so that they could eat the Passover. So Pilate came out to them and said, What charge do you bring against this man? If he were not a criminal, would we not have handed him over to you? At this, Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. The Jews answered him, We do not have the right to execute anyone. In order that the word of Jesus might be fulfilled, that he said, indicating the kind of death he, should die, he would die, so Pilate went back into the praetorium and summoned Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Do you say this on your own, or have others told you about me? I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests handed you over to me. What have you done? My kingdom does not belong to this world. If my kingdom did belong to this world, my attendants would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not here. Then you are a king? You say I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. What is truth? 
When Pilate had said this, he again went out to the Jews and he said to them, I find no guilt in him, but you have a custom that I release one prisoner to you at Passover. Do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? Not this one, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a revolutionary. <clears throat> then Pilate took Jesus and had him scourged, and the disciples wove a crown out of thorns and placed it on his head, and they clothed him in a purple cloak. They came to him and said, Hail, King of the Jews! And they struck him repeatedly. Once more Pilate went out, and he said to them, Look, I am bringing him out to you, so that you may know that I find no guilt in him. So Jesus came out, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple cloak. Pilate said to him, them. Behold the man. When the chief priests and the guards saw him, they cried out, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no guilt in him. We have a law, and according to that law he ought to die, because he made himself the Son of God. Now when Pilate heard this statement, he became even more afraid. He went back into the praetorium and he said to Jesus, Where are you from? Jesus did not answer him. So Pilate said to him, Do you not speak to me? Do you not know that I have power to release you and I have power to crucify you? You would have no power over me if it had not been given to you from above. For this reason, the one who handed me over to you has the greater sin. Consequently, Pilate tried to release him, but the Jews cried out, If you release him, you are not a friend of Caesar. Everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out. He seated him on the judge's bench in the place called Stone Pavement, in Hebrew, Gabbatha. It was preparation day for Passover, and it was about noon. And Pilate said to the Jews, Behold your king. They cried out, Take him away, take him away, crucify him. Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. Then Pilate handed Jesus over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus and carrying the cross himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, in Hebrew, Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with two others, one on either side, with Jesus in the middle. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus the Nazarene, King of the Jews. Now many of the Jews read the inscription, because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, Latin, and Greek. So the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but that he said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written.
When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and they divided them into four shares, a share for each soldier. They also took his tunic, but the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from top down. So they said to one another, Let's not tear it, but cast lots for it to see whose it will be. In order that the passage of scripture might be fulfilled that says, They divided, divided my garments among them, and for my vesture they cast lots. This is what the soldiers did. Standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Cleopas, and Mary of Magdala. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple there, whom he loved, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. From that hour, the disciple took her into his home. After this, aware that everything was now finished, in order that the scripture might be fulfilled, Jesus said, I thirst. There was a vessel filled with common wine. So they put a sponge soaked in wine on a sprig of hyssop, and they put it up to his mouth. When Jesus had taken the wine, he said, It is finished. And bowing his head, he handed over the spirit. Now, since it was preparation day, in order that the bodies might not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for the Sabbath day of that week was a solemn one, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs be broken and that they be taken down. So the soldiers came and they broke the legs of the first and then the other one who was crucified with Jesus. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one soldier thrust his lance into his side, and immediately blood and water flowed out. An eyewitness has testified, and his testimony is true. He knows that he is speaking the truth, so that you also may come to believe. For this happened, so that scripture passage might be fulfilled. Not a bone of it will be broken. And again, another passage says, they will look upon him whom they have pierced. We hold the death of the Lord deep in our hearts. Living now we remain with Jesus the After this, Joseph of Arimathea, secretly a disciple of Jesus, for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate if he could remove the body of Jesus, and Pilate permitted it. So he came, and he took his body. Nicodemus, the one who had first come to him at night, also came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, weighing about 100 pounds. They took the body of Jesus and they bound it with burial cloths, along with the spices, according to the Jewish burial custom. Now in the place where he had been crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb, in which no one had yet been buried. So they laid Jesus there, 
because of the Jewish preparation day, for the tomb was close by. The Gospel of the Lord. On this special day of Good Friday, a Friday where we stand with our Christian brothers and sisters throughout the world, we remember Jesus' persecution that he underwent and his horrific, horrible death upon the cross. And of course, 2,000 years ago, the cross upon which Jesus died was a symbol that in many instances was something to be feared. It was something that was a sign of death. It was something that was used for public execution of those people who were considered dangerous or criminals. And yet, in a few short minutes, you and I, as Christians, we come forward. And it will be the cross that we venerate. Our veneration will maybe be a genuflection, a touching of the cross, or a kiss of the cross. It is a tradition that allows us to pay this special tribute and uh, veneration of the cross, symbolic of the cross that Jesus died on. And yet, how would we explain this to our Christian friends? It seems rather odd, non-Christian friends. Truthfully, however, we know that for a lot of us, the cross is something that maybe we've become, we, we've kind of taken it for granted. It is something that we usually wear as a piece of jewelry. Um, we usually put gold on it, have it gold or put pearls on it or gems to make it more beautiful. It is something that is often maybe found in our homes or our religious institutions. It is on top of many of our churches. And it again is a symbol to us not only of our Christian faith, but maybe we have become somewhat immune to the true meaning of it. Truthfully, for us as Christians, it is not a symbol to be feared or a symbol of death, but rather, more than anything, for us it is a symbol of love. It is a reminder of the great love that God had for us and that allowing his son to accept this cross and his death on the cross that we, as his followers, may have life here on earth and life everlasting when we leave this earth. And of course, as stated previously, Holy Week um, sometimes had a tendency to be more about just remembering the events of Jesus Christ rather than making applicable and applying them to our own life. And we remember again that it is not only Jesus whose scourging and death that we remember, but we call to mind our own journey, journey with Jesus. We journey with him. And we carry our own burdensome crosses that weigh heavily upon us. Our crosses come in different shapes and sizes, whether it's our dysfunctional marital life, maybe it's the struggle that we have with our wayward daughter, whether it's the depression and the anxiety that we are continuously haunted by, whether it's the uncertainty that we have for our own vocation and our future and what it may entail, or whether it may be our own willingness to stand in solidarity with those other people throughout the world whose crosses are far heavier than our own, whether it's the people of Gaza, Kuwait, or Haiti, or the several others in war-torn countries throughout the world who are fleeing for their safety and for their own livelihood in a way that really reminds us that for many people, life in their countries has no value whatsoever. And so it is those people and numerous others throughout the world and within our own communities that we stand with, and we help them to carry the burden of their own cross, whatever it may be. But as we continue to journey with Jesus in the sacred time of the Triduum, we stand at the foot of the cross, hopefully humbled more than anything by love a love that really brought Jesus to the cross. We pray that the cross that you and I carry will be something that is not something that brings us death, but rather it will be something that recreates us, that it will recreate us, that we may be able to be free 
from the slavery to sin and the death of our own souls that we may come to know and to experience the new life of the resurrection. The new life of the resurrection here while we still live here on earth and the resurrection of eternal life that is the life that is to come. May God's peace and all that is good be with us as we come together to venerate and find meaning in the cross. I would now like to invite everyone to please stand as we bring our prayers of the faithful to the Lord. Our response will be, Lord, hear our prayer. What I would do is I would say this, and be silent, and then I would omit the prayer afterwards. Okay? And I, I number it all. Okay? Let us pray, dearly beloved, for the Holy Church of God that our God and Lord be pleased to give her peace, to guard her and to unite her throughout the whole world and grant that, leading our life in tranquility and quiet, we may glorify God the Father Almighty. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Let us pray also for our most holy Father, Pope Francis that our God and Lord, who chose him for the order of bishops, may keep him safe and unharmed for the Lord's holy church to govern the holy people of God. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Let us also pray for our bishop, for all bishops, priests, and deacons of the church, and for the whole of the faithful people. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Let us pray for our catechumens, that our God and Lord may open wide the ears of their inmost hearts and unlock the gates of his mercy, that having received forgiveness of all their sins through the waters of rebirth, they too may be one with Christ Jesus our Lord. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Let us pray also for all our brothers and sisters who believe in Christ, that our God and Lord may be pleased as they live the truth to gather them together and keep them in his one church. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Let us pray also for the Jewish people to whom the Lord our God spoke first, that he may grant them to advance in love of his name and in faithfulness to his covenant. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Let us pray also for those who do not believe in Christ, that enlightened by the Holy Spirit, they too may enter on the way of salvation. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Let us pray also for those who do not acknowledge God, that following what is right in sincerity of heart, they may find the way to God himself. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Let us pray also for those in public office, that our God and Lord may direct their minds and hearts according to his will for the true peace and freedom of all. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Let us pray, dearly beloved God, to God the Father Almighty, that he may cleanse the world of all errors, banish disease, drive out hunger, unlock prisons, loosen fetters, granting to travelers safety, to pilgrims return, health to the sick, and salvation to the dying. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Gracious and loving God, as we humbly stand before you at this holy time. We ask that you continue to pour forth your spirit upon all of us gathered here. Dispel the darkness of our hearts and of our world. 
Grant that we may always seek to have a correct faith and a certain hope and a perfect charity, that we may be able to carry out your holy and true command. We make this prayer through Christ our Lord. Amen. Please be seated. We now invite people to come forward down the center aisle, similar to what we do at communion, and uh, come and to venerate the cross, either through a kiss, a touch, or a genuflection, and then return to your seat by the side aisle.
Together we stand, and in one voice and one heart, we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by your help and mercy we may be free from sin, safe from all distress, as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory of your now and forever. May the receiving of your body and blood, Lord Jesus Christ, not bring me judgment or condemnation, but through your loving mercy, be for me the protection of mind and body, a healing remedy. My brothers and sisters, behold the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those who are called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but I only say the word, and my soul shall be healed. May the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ bring us all to everlasting life.
Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, you have restored us to life by the death and resurrection of your Christ. Preserve in us the work of your mercy, that partaking in this holy mystery, we may have life unceasingly devoted to you. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. My friends, the Lord be with you. With your spirit. Let us bow our heads and pray for God's blessing. O oh Lord, we pray that abundant blessing may descend upon your holy people who have honored the death of your Son in the hope of our resurrection. May pardon come, comfort be given, holy faith increase, and everlasting redemption be made secure. We ask this through Christ, who is our Lord and Savior. Amen. Please depart in silence.